Welcome to the Genesis Pod, your ultimate destination for real estate brilliance, business empowerment, and community growth. At the Genesis Pod, we're on a mission to turn dreams into reality because everyone deserves a sanctuary they proudly call home. Get ready to dive into a world of expert wisdom where we unveil the secrets of successful real estate investment and entrepreneurial triumphs. Whether you're a seasoned player or a newbie in the game, our seasoned pros are your guides through the intricate business labyrinth. Join us and let's embark on this exciting journey together as we build not just properties, but legacies. Tune in, ignite your aspirations, and become a part of the Genesis Pod family. Hey. Hey, everybody. Hey, how are you? What's up? Long time sorry. no see. Well, you I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm let you do your thing. I forgot. <laughs> okay, let's start over. Let's start over. No, no, no we good. Because it's, it's, like I said, I, I, I keep this really chill because uh-huh. it, it gets really... I don't like formal podcasts. I never did. Yeah, but yeah. Um, you should probably introduce yourself. <laughs> I, I I thought you were saying hey to me. That's why I said hi. But I didn't realize you had a whole intro. No, so no, go ahead. Me. No, it works out better this way. So just tell, say hi to everybody. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Hey, everybody. My name is Iman. I'm from Black Creative Inc. I was overthinking the intro to this podcast, yeah. but I think I found my footing. <laughs> Um, I'm here today. I'm really happy and excited to be talking to Rita about what I do and how I got into the cannabis industry. But it is a beautiful November day. Like it's not even cold outside. Like it's a little chilly, but it's like for November, it's really nice outside. So I'm just happy and I'm, I'm, I'm in a good mood. So yeah, let's get into it. Perfect. I took care of that. You know what's the cool thing about this is you're actually my first Canadian interview. Oh, your first Canadian interview. Cool. Yeah, I've never had one. I love that. That's awesome. Which is yeah. ironic considering New York's a border state to Canada. So you would think like that would be a thing all the time. It's not. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's not. Unfortunately, I mean, it's more... It's easier for Canadians to work with Americans than it is for Americans to work with Canadians for some reason. Which is dumb. Well, because actually, no, it has to do with the currency because the United States dollar is worth more. So you actually make more money if you work in the U.S. than if the U- than if Americans work in Canada, you know? Really? Yeah, you make less money if you work in Canada. Yeah, the Canadian dollar is something like one, it's like 40 it's like 60 cents to a dollar or something like that. Oh. Yeah, it's not good at all. That answers a lot of questions. <laughs> because yeah. my Madeline addiction up there is ridiculous. Your uh, what? Madeline's, they're like, there's like these little, like, they're so good. I'll send you a pack. They're like these little um, rich pound cakes. Uh-huh. They're like seashells. Oh, okay. They are delicious. And nothing against the united states they have their own culinary restrictions but something about like getting it from canada there's a freshness Uh that comes with it it's so good okay that's dope that's awesome yeah i did not know that i've never had that before so i gotta go check that out trader joe's has it i know whole foods has it uh starbucks obviously okay dope but yeah, they're they're really really good. Uh, well, welcome to the United States. Thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs> welcome to NYC. Yeah, I've been here for uh five and a half months now. I'm going on my sixth month, so what you, it's pretty what dope. Do you think of us so far? Um, you know, it's it's had its ups and downs. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's had its ups and downs, um, honestly, especially in the summer, like uh, when I got here in June, like things were a little stable, then they weren't, then they were stable, then they weren't. And I finally found my footing, so I'm much happier now. Um, But it taught me a lot about 
what it means to be resilient and just have so much blind faith in yourself that like you you could not know what's going to happen tomorrow but you're going to make it work you know i agree you know what's the interesting thing is when i when i when we first met we met at the convention in uh -huh. jersey uh -huh. and when you told me you were okay so real talk when you told me you were forgetting the first thing that popped into my head besides food uh -huh. <laughs> is the fact that you guys are actually ahead in the cannabis game compared to the yeah. United States. Yeah, 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 for sure. So what is that like going from one place that essentially kind of has it somewhat down pat to us and we're still like getting our sea legs, like we're still relatively in our infancy? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I'm going to only talk about New York when I answer this question. And I know it's not fair to compare one state to a whole country but i that's the only experience i've had with the uh cannabis industry in the u.s so i'm only going to speak on that and what i have to say is it's so much different when it's federally legal in the country versus when it's not and so i think that that was i, I mean i was ready for that anyway but it was the biggest thing to adjust to because it was like Oh, you can't ship from state to state. You can't, uh, you know, um, uh, enter different markets and each market has its own regulations and it's a lot to really adjust to and like learn and keep up with. So that's why people mostly stick within their state. But if it was federally legal, like opportunities for growth would be just like a hundred times more essentially. Um, so I think maybe that is the direction that the U.S. is headed towards and I really hope we see that happen soon but it was really nice to see the resilience and um the optimism of the uh, some of the social equity applicants in new york i got to sit down with them multiple times and really hear and understand their struggles and their complaints and one thing we always walked away with was an action plan so these were people who were like really on the ground floor fighting to get their stores open and some of them actually did. There's Terp Brothers in Astoria. Um, there's Conbud. There's Smack Village. There's Gotham. So it's pretty dope to see the legal ones coming, uh, popping up in New York. And I'm really happy that I got to be here when that was happening because um, it gives me an opportunity to network a little bit better. And these people don't have uh, someone who is giving them the service of social media marketing yet because it's a new market. So. Um, yeah, I've been, um, I've been finding my footing in the industry as well, but mostly just focused on building my network and building that trust and, you know, establishing a name for myself here as well. So for someone who has, who comes with a digital background, what do you see being the most complicated part of this? Um, I definitely think it comes down to two things. The first one is uh, always going to be the regulations because, um, again, they're a lot, they're very strict, especially more so with the legal brands than they are with the, um, uh, what do you call it with uh, with well, I mean well the the non authorized ones or the illicit ones or legacy ones whatever you want to call it they're not really even regulated in the first place so they pretty much get away with everything but when you're a legal business you really have to abide by the rules because you might have investors or you might have um, people who check up on you and see if you're breaking any guidelines and that sort of thing so the marketing restrictions are pretty tight but you know the main difference i found between new york and the rest of canada is that the packaging is actually allowed to be expressive and creative which is something that's not happening in canada at all like all of just have to be a solid color and uh the batch number and all of that has to be printed on the package itself it can't be a sticker and there's a certain color it has to be in a certain font size and like it's really really regulated with the packaging which takes away the whole element of branding 
in cannabis so i'm really upset about that but it's it's also encouraged the growers to be more about their quality now because there is no competition for the packaging and we know packaging influences a, a customer's um inclination to buy as well um another thing that's different is that they have open displays in the dispensary so you can actually see the product um it's behind uh it's behind a glass most of the time but you can see the product sitting out there and um that's not something that happens in canada either there's always a storage unit in the back that has all the product in stock and whenever uh, you only get to see uh, the menu items on an iPad or some sort of some sort of screen, so it's a very different shopping experience. Um, but I think to answer the first part of your question, um, marketing within those guidelines is very tricky for these brands. Um, but they have it a little easier in New York than they do in Canada. And the second thing I would say is budgeting because. Again, a lot of them are new businesses. Um, you know, maybe they're not heavy in their cash flow yet, so they have to be really careful with where they invest their money. And I, I'm still new here, right? So it is a bit of a risk for them to work with someone who um, is a going to charge them a significant amount of money every single month for social media services, and b they might not see that translate into sales immediately. So. To some of them, it's like you're burning money, which I totally understand. Uh, but at the end of the day, most of us are online, on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, on X, on TikTok, consuming content constantly, you know? So it's like if you're not on there, you're just missing out on a completely different set of an audience that you could have if you were willing to make the investment. Um, but yeah, that would be the two most challenging things, budgeting and marketing within the restrictions. Okay. You said something that was really important about the, the role of social media, especially mm -hmm. in relation to this industry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a very stupid question. <laughs> okay. Be prepared. Sure. How did... How do you handle when people comment underneath the page where it's something that you know full blown well is not true, but it's because the propaganda has been around for so long, it's rather complicated to shut down. Uh huh. That's a, that's not a stupid question at all. That's actually a really good question, and it's something that holds a lot of people back from making content because they don't want to experience that. Um. But really, the simplest way to answer that question is that the internet is a place for people who are really sad and lonely to have a voice. And they do it without a name or, and without a face most of the time because they know on a deep level that what they're saying is crazy. But they want the validation that comes from getting notifications when you open your app. So they will purposely comment hateful things. And because they're sad and their life is miserable, that's the only thing they can think of to say. So I think it, when you think about it that way, it becomes so clear that you can't take it personally. And I've personally, I've experienced this too. And trust me, it used to consume me for a really long time. Like I would be in the shower thinking of what I'm going to respond to this troll. And then I was like, why do I need to do that? Like, and this is not on Instagram, it's more so on TikTok. And I was like, why do I need to do that? Like, this person at the end of the day is uh, bringing me into an energy that I don't want to operate at. And it's like defense, it's like a defensive energy and it's like arrogant and it's like, you know, uh, egotistical. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have anything to prove to you, you know? So I think it's always a good idea to kill them with kindness. Um, and if you can't, then just laugh at them. And, you know, I do it in a, in, in a pretty sassy way where it's like, I really would have said this otherwise, but you wanted to make yourself sound really smart. And so now I'm just going to turn it into a joke, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not telling you to play psychological games with these trolls, but they are people at the end of the day. And sometimes they just need to be reminded that like, yo, you're, you're saying some really irrelevant stuff that you just regurgitated because you heard it somewhere else or because you want a certain type of reaction from people based on your comment. 
Um, and at the end of the day, the block button exists. So if you don't want to see it, you don't want to respond to it, just hit them with the block and, you know, go about your day. Don't let it consume you. But in a way, it kind of is, in a, in a other way, kind of consuming because you and I both know the pandemic really put social media to another level. Mm -hmm. And I think, and cannabis and the whole industry is very big on mental health. So how does someone who specializes in content creation, digital marketing, all of that, balance that out that now everything is live so mm -hmm. it's not just like you know it's not like when we were younger and just like certain points where no one's business and the others were like we'll let you know when we let you know mm -hmm. everyone has something to say and everything is so sensitive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly everyone does have something to say and yeah they that's true that they are really sensitive but you can't let that hold you back from speaking your truth and i think that the more you continue to speak your truth the more people who hear you are going to find you in your content and they're going to engage with you and they're going to stand up for you against the trolls um and so that's why building a tribe is so important that's why i talk about building a tribe um a lot on my website and also in my content is because you don't really need the engagement that comes from a troll to make your content pop what you need is a tribe who cares about what you're posting every single time you post it and if the trolls come along those people will put the trolls in their place because they're genuine fans of you so and and nobody's recruiting anybody to do this people are really just in the comment section all day every day going back and forth with each other you know so it's like i'm not, I'm not making things up that is exactly what happens but when you think about it that way it becomes so much more clear that you have to just continue speaking your truth and that's where i feel like your mental health will improve um but at the end of the day i don't think there's an easy answer to this there's no real balance that you can predict because some days you're just more tired than others you don't want to see certain content you don't have the inspiration or the motivation or the creativity or the will and you're consumed by all these other thoughts maybe other life events world events whatever it is like we're all going through things at the end of the day so if you've got to take a break from social media take it like it's not the end of the world nobody's gonna be like oh my god where have you been or none of that like when you come back they'll be like oh shit i haven't seen your content in a while and they're gonna pick right back up where they left from you know so the only thing that will slow down is your engagement obviously as you take your break but don't be too worried about the numbers just Make sure you feel good about what you're posting and you feel good after you post and you feel, you know, you feel like you're mentally in a good place. So you mentioned tribe. Uh -huh. I, I say this all the time on my page because, I mean, when I talk to people and I say to them that for me, I don't pay attention to my follower count mm -hmm. as much as people think I should. I really don't. <laughs> right. I know you hear all the time, your followers should be way higher than this. You should be doing it. And for me, it's not really the numbers. It's who's paying attention. Yeah, exactly. And that's a good way to go about it, to be honest. So how do you explain that without sounding like a condescending douche? Um, well, you know, again, you're always going to be misinterpreted on the internet, so just speak your truth. And if people think you're a condescending douche, it just highlights the fact that they don't have any self-confidence, and they get their self-confidence from superficial things like a follower count, or likes, or comments, or whatever, and or views, or whatever. And to me, that is an easy way to end up in a place where you are only creating social media content for a desired outcome and not because you actually want to serve your audience so your content becomes dry really quickly and your followers notice it um when you when you go about that approach so that's why people who don't ever respond to comments or don't ever answer questions or don't ever talk personally to their audience like they they just post things that are um 
you know, not open for debate or not open for conversation, like a picture of them at a beach or something, you know, and it's like, yeah, okay, cool, great picture, but how is this helping elevate your tribe? Because now you just have people who think you're pretty or who think it's, uh, you know, what you're doing is cool, but they're never going to actually be fans of you and buy from you and put money in your pocket. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're basically saying there's a difference between being a genuine person on social media versus just doing it for the attention. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yeah, exactly. To sum it up, basically. And that raises a question that I, I actually asked a couple of years ago, and I'm going to bring it back now that you're here. Because mm-hmm. maybe you can actually answer it. <laughs> okay. What is an influencer? What is an influencer supposed to be? And what would we like to see? And what would we would like to see from the term influencer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good question. I'm going to try my best to stay on topic while I explain this. But essentially, most influencers come from wealthy families. And it's important to mention this because when you already come from a wealthy family, it's easy to sell a lifestyle because it looks good and you didn't have to work for it. So you really just get to enjoy it, right? And I think that when influencers first started popping up on Instagram, it was um, subconscious in terms of how addicted people became to these aesthetic lifestyle looking photos hair makeup um you know mostly targeted towards women but also with products and with other brands just um just uh uh, uh, people who don't really offer much substance except really nice things to look at um and so i think for a long time that is what an influencer was And recently, there's been a shift towards influencers basically promoting consumerism, um, because what ends up happening is a lot of these brands will reach out to to influencers with a certain number of following on their uh, Instagram or TikTok profile and basically pay them to promote the product. And the reason why they do that is so that that influencer's audience gets exposed to this new brand and this new product and they usually receive some sort of discount code when they uh, shop from the influencers link. So when you have a culture of a social media app like Instagram where it really is all about consumerism, it becomes almost like a no-brainer to be more, uh, to, to lack more substance and to be all about appearance Um, And that's where, you know, brands and people individually have to actually ask themselves what they're doing it for. Because I said, if you're just going to do it for a check and you don't actually care about the people who are following you, they're eventually going to realize that. And when they realize that, they're going to know that you are not being genuine with them from the start and they're going to feel used and they're going to feel played. So you always want to take the genuine approach And I think that that's where another branch of influencers has started coming out. And so these are people that give their honest input and feedback on either products or brands, but also um, situations. So you have a lot of content now centered around relationships and dating um, or sports or, uh, again, beauty could be something as well and cannabis could be something as well so you have a different branch of influencers now which are just regular people who enjoy creating content for the purpose of sharing information about whatever it is they're doing that day what brand they're consuming where they're eating where they're shopping or they even offer uh, story times on things they did and just give You know, and so they build a more genuine audience because there's always something new to consume. There's always something new to think about, to talk about, to uh, engage with. So, excuse me. So that would be the uh, that would be the other branch of of influencers, in my opinion. So, okay, 
Now, with that being said, when it comes to influencing and the cannabis industry, do they tend to clash sometimes or do you see them kind of eventually supporting one another? Well, I think the only reason why they clash right now is because of how tight the restrictions are on the apps themselves, especially TikTok, because it has so much potential. But I agree that it is an app that children use a lot. And because of that, it shouldn't be freely marketed. Um, so I understand that point of view. But also, it just gives people, regular people, who are misinformed, like you said, and already in comment sections on other platforms discussing misinformation, TikTok gives them a chance to understand a different point of view because of the type of influencers, like I said earlier, that are giving honest input on whatever it is they're using or experiencing or going through or whatnot. You know, and that's why TikTok is such a powerful platform but um otherwise i don't see i don't really see why it would clash other than if you were being paid to promote a product or you know weed or flour whatever that is low quality but you know you care about your check so it doesn't matter you know you just want to have something go up on your Instagram page. And so, it, again, it becomes all about honesty. It becomes about authenticity. It becomes about being like, yeah, I got paid to promote this, but I'm going to be honest, it wasn't that great. Like, you know, and it's like, I really want to say good things and I want to make you a dope video, but I don't want to mislead my audience and uh, have them mad at me for making them buy something that is really not what it's supposed to be or not what it's marketed as you know so that would be probably the only the only uh place where i would see that cra uh, clashing between being an influencer um, and being a being a cannabis consumer there's so many things you touched during this entire conversation that i love and it's the importance of authenticity you know setting boundaries mm -hmm. and things like that and someone mm -hmm. who made this a business and are in, in a way a career for themselves, how do you maintain those standards and how do you let people know what their standards are? In terms of in terms of being an influencer on Instagram? In terms of being an influencer on Instagram or, you know, specializing in content creation when it comes to the industry. Because there's certain things that like everyone has that line. Like there's certain things that I just don't feel comfortable talking about because it's not my specialty. Mm -hmm. So that's why I talk to people like you, or I'll talk to Al from Spark9, or I'll like reach out to see what this means. Mm -hmm. when, um, when you're reaching out to clients or when you gain potential clients, what is the important things that they should know when working with you? Um, well, they should know that they're not getting somebody else's template, you know? And that's where I think a lot of social media companies are messing up right now. And that's why it's leaving such a bad taste in these business owners' mouths and they don't want to start over or try again because they already had an experience and it didn't go that well. So what I do when I onboard a new client is, number one, I ask them if they know their business and they know their ideal client and they know why an ideal client would want to pick them over their competitors. Because unfortunately, there's too many people in cannabis right now specifically that don't really understand who their target audience is, but they think that the product is, is going to be so good that it's going to sell itself. And so one of the things that I do is I try to really define their target audience because I spent a lot of time on social media myself, uh, like personally, you know, just uh, with my personal account, consuming content and also posting my own content. So I know the types and the segments of people on the internet as a whole when it comes to social media because that's really the only place right now like of course people are discussing in forums and things like reddit and and whatnot but most of us have discourse on instagram tiktok facebook youtube and whatnot these days um so when you are delving into these platforms on a personal level you collect so much more data and i think that that's what makes me stand out is i've actually collected this data on my own 
from my own personal social media use. So I'm already going into it, being able to put myself in your ideal audience's shoes and asking myself the question, if I was following this brand, what, what type of content would I want to see from them? What would make me stop scrolling and swipe and read and engage and comment and share what type of information and so when they understand their ideal audience it makes my job a little bit easier and then once i understand the ideal audience i then go and create um, categories for content and so those categories are exclusive to that business so like okay there might be crossovers between you and another brand but it's never going to be all the same categories of content in terms of like quotes or um, you know, educational content, or entertainment content, or uplifting content, or um, spiritual content. You know, so there's different uh, boxes that you get into, and once the the client understands that the content is going to stay within these buckets because this is what your target audience wants to see. So we're not going to be posting random things. So please don't upload random things. Please don't share stories. Or, or memes that are political or don't align with what your brand categories are and whatnot. And usually they really are, they're really good at understanding that. Um, but if they don't, then it's a sign that we might not be compatible because they may end up posting their own things, which throws off what I'm doing and the results are just not as strong. And so, you know, it just uh, doesn't go well from there. So. I just make sure that they understand that, you know, I'm going to really try to dig deep and understand who your audience is so I can make the right type of content. But you have to trust that sticking within this type of content is the way to go. And usually when they do that, then they see within three months, within six months, within, you know, a year, um, just upwards in terms of, in terms of growth, in terms of engagement, in terms of views, just growth and uh, an increase in numbers always. <coughs> Oddly enough, the one thing I have noticed is that the industry is far more corporate than people think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see Snoop, you see all that. It, don't wrong, Snoop is, is, is the man. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he's corny, but <laughs> Snoop, is, <laughs> Snoop, is, Snoop is cool, right? Yeah. But when you're in it, it's far more corporate. It's far more elegant is the word yeah. probably is the best way to look it. Yeah. How do you get people to see that part? Because even talking to you, and, I, and I've seen your, and yes, I have followed you on Instagram, <laughs> and I have seen you social media, mm -hmm. and I have met you. It's just there's a mm -hmm. comfortable formality that's in the industry that people mm -hmm. do not see on the outside. How do you explain the industry to the others, as the cool kids say? Mm -hmm. God, I'm old. Right. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, I don't really talk about my work with my parents because they don't really like it. And it kind of drove us apart in a way. Um, so I, if I was explaining this to like my dad's friend or my mom's friend or something, I would basically say that it's just like working a regular job, to be honest, except you have more fun because <laughs> you get to smoke weed. And that's, you know, that's the whole thing that we are bonded over anyway, is the fact that we love weed, we love cannabis, we love consuming it, we want to legalize it, we want everybody to know the good benefits of it. And even if you don't consume it, you still want everybody to know the good benefits of it because there's been too much propaganda and too too many lives that have been disrupted with the war on drugs that happened in America and it was just completely unnecessary, you know? So I think that I would just be like, yeah, it's just like any other, it's just like any other industry. Um, you'll find a lot more people who are more motivated to do very bold things and to take big actions and to challenge certain barriers that have been set in place by governments or municipalities or whatever. 
And when you talk to these people and or you hear them, you know, giving out a, 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 a giving a speech at a conference or something like that, you just become so much more proud of working in the industry and proud of being around people who were directly impacted by all this war on drugs propaganda, but chose to use it in their favor and chose to fight for the entire world to see that it's not it's not going to kill you. It's not a drug that's going to kill you, you know? Right. And um, in terms of, you know, there's so many there's so many levels to it. But I think I, one of the things is, that I don't like is, like, when I started my business, I did that because I didn't really like working in corporate. And I found it to be too formal for my liking. And sometimes I get those vibes from the cannabis industry, too, which always makes me question, like, is this intentional or is it just because we've been so conditioned to uh, 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 conduct business in, in that sort of manner, you know? Um, and yeah. sometimes, what was that? I didn't see it that way. I always thought it was because everything is so sensitive right now and everything's still relatively new uh -huh. that, you know, when you like you meet someone for the first time. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> that person and you like are not ready to smell each other's farts and junk. <laughs> right and I so you're very that. like you know you're very polite and you're very like, cordial so mm -hmm. i i think part of it is a lot down to like the fear because we don't have as you said it's not federally regulated so that blanket of protection is not there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know i get what you're saying yeah but oh that's a great perspective but that's also a great perspective as well because i didn't see it that way before that how part of it is is probably down to the the, the culture of our culture itself uh -huh, uh -huh, exactly and i find that really fascinating considering the fact that this is the one of the few industries in at least once again just like you and i when you keep this to new york in the u.s uh -huh, uh -huh. that it's one of the few industries that can build something fresh from the others like i'm in real estate as my day job I'm a right. lot of things as my day job. But let's find with real estate. Real estate's been around for, for generations. It's 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 been it's there. It's not a the industry's not going anywhere. Yep. But in the eyes of like certain laws and codes and things like that, the cannabis industry is a baby. You they exactly. can redefine professionalism. Exactly. Yes, you're right. There's so much opportunity to cross over from other industries, like exactly even with real estate, but also with accounting, with law, with uh, social media, with all the other with all the other tiers, because it's not just about growing the weed and selling it. It's about everything that has to do with running a business, too. So, yeah, there is so much opportunity for people who want to get into the cannabis industry to get into it through other services like ancillary services instead of having to apply for a dispensary license or growing the weed themselves. So I think that's another thing they don't really realize that much about the industry yet too, but you're right. I think the size and the new, the, 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 the fact that it's such a new industry is probably impacting how people are engaging in their business endeavors. But I've been at really cool events run by like really cool professional people and it was not corporate and it was fun and, Things went smooth and I felt like, okay, this is dope. This is the cannabis industry. But whenever I do go to events that are a bit too corporate, it feels a lot like a, a talent show. You know, it's like, oh, everybody's here to present the best version of themselves. But is it the authentic version of you that you would be presented if maybe the, your guard wasn't so high because you were in this type of business environment? You know, and again, there's always balance. There's always the place and the time to do things like that and the place and the time to do other more fun events. Um, but I found that a lot of the conferences are starting to get so corporate to me and I just, I don't enjoy them anymore. I want to actually go to cannabis events, like themed events and interact and network with people that way. I think it's really interesting coming from this side because I'm like new, new, like I'm a toddler new. <laughs> so this, and coming from this side, it's, interesting that and you said something that the fact that when you're at certain events it's very formal and corporate and then there's other events where you kind of get to kick in with the people you can kind of like try to figure this out and meet other people you kind of form 
relationships or alliances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Watching the Game of Thrones way too many times. But <laughs> when do you do you mm -hmm. see that eventually there will be a balance between the two? Because I think that that's a really important thing. I don't want the industry to lose sight of what makes them them. You know, we can't have this conversation unless we're going to talk about race, because that is exactly what it comes down to. Um, and unfortunately, the people who people of color who are in the cannabis industry have built the culture. And white Americans have profited off of it. So if we're going to have that conversation about balance, we got to have a conversation about a balance in power between people of color in the cannabis industry and white Americans. And we know right now that only 2% of cannabis businesses are owned by women of color. So there is, I think, a really long way to go before it's balanced. And especially because there was such a heavy propaganda, uh, propaganda around destroying the culture of weed in the eyes of the general public with the war on drugs that it's going to take a lot of really positive marketing campaigns to turn people's opinions around and that's where i think that people of color in the cannabis industry are going to step up to the plate uh with their creativity with their passion with their um with their courage to push the boundaries a little and actually be like you know what you guys you guys really profited off of telling everybody that we're criminals and we're druggies and, you know, this and that and locking up our family members. And now you want to come in here and make all this money off of it. And I don't think that's fair. So I hope that there is a lot more campaigns around bringing attention exactly to what you said, to the culture of cannabis, but also to the legality and the safeness of it. Um, without it being dis, uh, without being disproportionate in terms of the gender, actually gender and race of who owns the businesses that are profitable in the industry versus, you know, who owns businesses that are struggling or have not even opened yet. You know what you said something's really interesting is the fact that the importance of like the symptoms that got us here. So let's like race, gender. Yeah gender, sex, you know, yep. Yep. you know, all of that plays a role in the ripple effect that, that where we're in right now. As someone exactly. who's in the social media landscape, yeah, how, exactly. what role do, let's run with me, what role do we have in breaking those assumptions? Well, uh, again, it always comes down to speaking your truth. And so if you feel a certain way, don't be afraid to say it. If you see if you see something that you don't like, speak up on it because closed mouths don't get fed, right? And they like that is basically what we have to live by when we're trying to bring attention to cannabis in a positive light as people of color on social media specifically. And I think that when you own your truth, like you're really unwavering, unapologetic and just open and but also reasonable with your opinions and with your content, then people respond to it. People are more inclined to respond to it with their own truth and their own positivity than they are to criticize it. And again, if they do criticize it, it says a lot more about themselves than it does about you. So if we want an equal industry or a balanced industry then we have to a be willing to put in the work to talk about the fact that there is an imbalance in the first place and b be so be so um committed to changing that because uh, unfortunately, the obstacles and the setbacks in the cannabis industry are very frequent and very um, unexpected. So a lot of the times you'll be fighting a fight 
and then you'll get hit with something random that you didn't expect it out of nowhere that kind of discourages you. So we have to be, we have to have each other's backs. We have to encourage each other to speak up. We have to check in on each other. We have to go to each other's events. Um, we have to post each other's businesses. And it really comes down to us supporting each other. And, you know, it doesn't mean not supporting anybody else who doesn't identify as a woman of color or a person of color in the cannabis industry. But it does mean that more of our attention should be focused on bringing attention to the issue at hand versus uh, pandering to whoever has the money and the access and the resources and you know, leaving your own people behind and that sort of thing. You said two things at this at, at multiple points of this. The one thing I do need to discuss is the fact that you said that every business consultation or every client you work with has their own unique system or their own unique um, hosting plan, uh -huh. their own plan. Uh -huh. I'm going to ask a weird question. And my weird question is this. I've noticed through Free My Weed Man and, <laughs> you know, Instagram posts and things like that, that storytelling is really important. Mm -hmm. How as a social media creator, as a content creator and a social media marketer and like the, 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 the guru of social media, how do you make sure that story gets through? Because it sounds like storytelling is very important in cannabis. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is. And it all comes down to the hook. The very first like two or three seconds of your video sets the tone for the entire video. So that one of the strategies that you can use as an interesting hook is to start the video as if you are ar arranging your phone to be in placement for the video. But in reality, you already know exactly where the phone is going to go. It's just not static when it starts as a video. And so the attention is captured a little bit easily. There's more movement and you can already be talking. Like for example, you start recording. So I went to the store today and then you set your phone down and then you back up a little and da 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 da, -da, -da you know? And so that way the story starts right away. It's not, hey guys, today I wanna tell you about this story. Like that does not work anymore. People don't have the attention span for that like they used to. So you have to just get right into it and um, or it's either that or you could be doing something unrelated while you're telling the story. So, for example, brushing your hair, putting on makeup, rolling a J, going for a walk or walking your dog or um, uh, changing your sweater, buttoning up your sweater, zipping up your shirt. I don't know, whatever it is that you want to do while you are telling the story. So that requires you to multitask and it's a little bit more challenging than what it looks like online to be honest um it does come with practice though so just keep experimenting with those two hook techniques and don't let your story drag on like get to the point quick and then tell people the plot twist or the conclusion or whatever within a reasonable amount of time and usually if your video is under like three minutes you will get good feedback um, in terms of engagement. Um, but the more dramatic your story is, the more engagement you get. And the more wild your story is, the more engagement you get as well. So if something crazy happens, like tell that story on your social media. Don't just rant about it to your friends or rant about it in your group chat or whatever, because it's just entertaining and people want to hear, you know, what happened to you and what you went through and whatnot. So that would be my um, that would be my advice for that. And then again, don't expect the outcome. Just tell the story. Just own your truth. Just be honest. And the results will come when they come. Have you ever audited a social media account? Absolutely. Absolutely. I used to actually, that was part of my sales strategy for a while. I would just find Instagram accounts that I thought needed my help and I would send them an audit and I would give them a score on their overall Instagram page. And then the, the, it was a PDF that included why you got that score and, um, you know, what I would do to improve it essentially. 
Um, but yeah, I, I've done that a couple of times. That's, I feel like that's going to be a necessity for me later. <laughs> yeah, feel free to use that idea. Like, honestly, it's such a great idea because it's like. <laughs> I may just call you and have you do it because I am so, what is it, like, so, me, social media insecure, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Because, not because I want it to be perfect. I know there's no such thing as perfection, but it's because. I want to make sure that people, I always looked at my social media accounts that if people visit my pages, either mine or Genesis or anything that I do, it feels like you're hanging out at a family's house mm. and you're like you're kicking it on the stairs with your cousins and everyone and, or your really best friends. Nice. I really wanted them to feel really comfortable coming there. That's why I wasn't really so focused on my follower count. Mm -hmm. I was focused more on do people feel welcomed to my page so right it's mostly me being goofy and discovering oh my god i didn't know my canva page can do that but <sighs> it's but the more i get into it the more i'm realizing that there's a there's something that i haven't touched yet which is more of the creative side of social media and the uh -huh. storytelling side of social media uh -huh. And listening to you, I'm I'm realizing that I have not touched that at all. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it takes some time to um, get comfortable with that, honestly, because a lot of us are scared of being perceived because we know that people who follow us on social media are also following us in real life. But what I want everybody who's listening to this podcast to remember is that the people who are following you right now that know you in real life is not your target audience. So it doesn't matter what they think about you. Um, you, your whole Instagram strategy is to reach a new audience of people who specifically want to see your content. And that means strangers are going to engage with your content. And that means you can't have a preconceived notion of what the perception is going to be because you don't know these people and they don't know you. So all you can do is just be who you are authentically and even if people who know you in real life see your content and they're like cringe weird whatever this that it's like at the end of the day they were never going to they were never a part of your target audience so it doesn't matter it really does not matter what they think um but it, it requires a lot of patience to be uh, to create social media content because some of these apps are just tricky to navigate especially instagram with its one million menus and buttons and whatnot <laughs> you know but um yes, but yeah I, sorry go ahead yeah i just got the hang of the whole so there's a collaborator section right so you have your tag and then you have invite collaboration uh-huh uh-huh i was today years old when i realized that you have to have it on your account of that, that person has to have it on their account that they're allowed, that they're inviting the collaboration. Yeah. And it takes like a couple of weeks to process. Yep. Yep. It's, um, yep. It's a lengthy process. It's not something that's really quick. Um, you can tag someone easily in a video, but yeah, the collaboration part of it is like a whole thing. And then on top of that, you have to be really careful with music because I know mm -hmm. at least on Spark 9's page, there's there's been times where it says okay you can play this music in the United States, but <laughs> right <laughs> yeah like Russia like okay does that yeah mean yeah no they do do that they do do that but again your target audience is not in Russia so it doesn't really matter but um but yeah you have to use specific music well they won't even give you access to some of the other songs that you can pick on Instagram reels when you're um, just a personal account mm -hmm. um, because they don't have, they're not licensed to be used for commercial use. So it's just like this whole legal part of it and whatnot, whatever, blah, blah. But yeah, if you ever get those notifications, like you can, I don't necessarily recommend doing anything other than just don't use that particular song again. And um if they uh, if they delete your video or take it down or whatever, then obviously you can't use it again. But usually they they don't do that. They just give you the notification that it can't be played in other countries. So yeah. What is the one thing you want people to know about safe social media use? 
safe social media use. Oh man, please, for the love of God, do not click any links in your DMs. Do not click any links from any person who is claiming to sell you something, to send you something, to help you with something. Always communicate through email with people on LinkedIn because the scams have gotten so much more intelligent. And unfortunately, a lot of people are claiming that their competitors hacked them or their competitors reported them. But really what they did is they believed that a, a catfish account representing somebody else wanted to work with them or send them money or send them product or something. And they clicked a link in the DM conversation and their account, uh, they lost access to their account. So the number one way to know if you are talking to someone who has a spam account and is trying to hack you is to quickly go through their feed. And if all their posts are posted on the same day or posted a couple of days apart, like November 14th, November 13th, November 12th, November 1st, that is most likely a scam account. And so that person has been trying to build a feed that looks believable, but because you didn't check the date it was posted, you fell for it. But if you did check the date that it was posted, you would see they were all posted in a row. And typically people don't do that if they have a real Instagram account. So that's an easy way to know. Um, that you're dealing with someone who is fraudulent. Another easy way to know is that they are claiming to be a professional, but they give you a Gmail account and it's like they don't have a website and uh, they don't have a phone number or they don't want to give you a phone number. It's shady. It's not real. Don't click it. Don't click any links. Don't email them and just hit block or, and report spam. And that way you could keep your Instagram. And um, yeah, you won't be upset if you lose your account. Okay, next question. What I know these are like rapid fire questions. And this <laughs> and that and this. <laughs> yeah, I'm here for it. All right. Next rapid fire question. What's the one thing you want people to know about cannabis and social media? Um, what's the one thing I want people to know mm -hmm. about cannabis and social media? Um, I guess just um I don't, um, I don't know. Hmm. I actually don't have a quick answer to that one. I'm not sure. Do you have any other questions? Maybe I have to think about it for a bit. We could come back to that one if you, if you have any other questions. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> this is I don't know because I just, I just it's feel just, like so much we have touched on, like in this entire thing. Like now it's like, okay. So it went from now I would, it's like it's not just about cannabis and social media but also about you know standards and making sure that when you do post on these things or when you do engage with people that you're engaging with people that make sense for you you mm -hmm. know it's just it, it this is why i said what i said that i like to keep it relaxed because you mm -hmm. don't know what you're what, what's gonna hit and if no i just i guess i just had to think about it for a second you know right. that one hit me a little bit a little bit unexpected but you're right as you're talking i'm i think i'm thinking of a couple of things like people think that they can just throw up a couple of stock photos and use that as marketing for their social media page or they just have to post themselves smoking weed or they just have to post close-ups of the weed and i encourage you to experiment and try different things and try different environments of you know where you're shooting and what you're shooting and experiment with your captions experiment with reels experiment with going live and um don't be scared to don't be scared to um to share you know information about cannabis that's authentic to you you don't have to do so much of the educational part of it when you're first starting because it's pretty cut and paste and so if you do want to do the educational part of it, add your own opinions, add your own thoughts, or even talk a little bit about how you found out this information as well, too. For example, if you want to make a post about the endocannabinoid system, don't just make a post about the endocannabinoid system, but make a video explaining how you found out there is an endocannabinoid system and the most thing that surprised you. You know, and so that way there's a little bit more to it than it just being an educational post. It's like personal to you as well. 
and it just hit me. I have a random question. Yeah, of course. And it's so random. Like, where did this come from? Social media and AI. Hmm. Mm. Creepy. Very creepy. I don't like it. I don't know where it's going, but like, it's inevitable. I, I know it's inevitable, but it's it's annoying. Like AI, I can understand it for like little things, like like edit edit a post, like that part I get because there are moments when we have misspelling and we're human and we're fallible. But I'm seeing a lot of like accounts now promoting like this AI creator thing, uh-huh. and something about that doesn't sit right with me. It kind of reminds me of Victoria's Secret, and technically, even though Victoria's Secret is run by a male for so long everyone thought it was a female yeah and it's giving me the same brain vibes you know it just doesn't have the same authenticity but it's like fast fashion yeah i hear what you're saying i hear what you're saying i think um it's a much longer conversation, to be honest with you, but I'll give you the short breakdown of it. Essentially, oh, Instagram, no, coming back. Good. yeah, like Instagram is owned by Facebook, so Facebook is the one that's really responsible for this AI stuff right now. And actually, they just renamed themselves to Meta. And I don't know what's really going on with that, but I don't think we can control it because there's already celebrities like. Kendall Jenner who have made AI versions of themselves on social media and that AI version of themselves talks to their fans for them so it's happening um I don't think we can do anything about it I think we can just be cautious of it and make sure that we are engaging with real people and not clicking any links from any AI accounts in case it's a hack and whatnot and just being cautious of the type of AI content we're, create, we're, we're consuming too, because I've seen a lot of it be like spiritual or motivational. And it's like, okay, cool. But how am I supposed to be motivated by this message coming from a person that's not a real person? It's, it was computer generated, you know? So it's like, why do I need to take advice from a computer generated person? <laughs> you know? So yeah. Yeah, that's really all I'm gonna say about that. Oh, I mean, it's just it just hit me like while you're here, let me ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was a great question. It was a really great question. What do you think about it? I think it's it depends on the circumstances. On social media itself, because there's so many social media can be social media in my opinion is a weapon. It can uh-huh. be used for good and it can uh-huh. be used for evil. It depends exactly. on who is utilizing it. And when you throw AI into the mix, it kind of gives it a Marvel effect. Yeah, you're right about that. That makes sense. So you don't know if you're getting like a genuine experience of an account or it's Thanos. I'm oh, crying. I get what you're saying. Okay. I get it if it makes sense. Like, you know, like you said, sometimes I'll, I'll use AI for like little things, like for photos or if I'm sketching something because, and I mentioned Canva before, Canva has this sketch to image thing on their, on their um, site. That makes sense. But when you're doing a full account on it and you're, and everything is not, real genuine and people are taking that and using it as fact mm-hmm. that's kind of where i draw the line mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. no accountability attached to it mm-hmm. i agree with you i wholeheartedly so, agree with you yeah and it's already a social media is already so complicated with you know people spewing their own issues and all the other stuff as we discussed in the very beginning you know mm-hmm. to add that to it it's just it, it kind of drowns out the cool people. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, it really does. And it drowns out people who are trying to actually put in the work to make um, social media content that's interesting. And people are really creative on social media and the way that they edit videos and 
do that sort of stuff can't be replicated by AI, at least not now. So it is kind of sad to see more engagement go towards um, uh, AI accounts and AI content, but it's just new right now. And so I think that's why it's interesting to people is because they're like in disbelief, you know, and they're just like, oh, wow, like this is actually happening. Like what's going on? So hopefully it will die down, but um, I can't, uh, I can't personally engage with that type of content. It just doesn't appeal to me. I generally think that this is going to be one of those situations that you and I are going to have a couple more of these conversations. <laughs> probably. You're no, probably right about that. No, because sometimes when there are really interesting topics, it doesn't feel like, when you and I talk, it feels like it's like we're having a conversation and we're chilling. But to some people, it's like, I'll get emails of them sending to me. You had someone on and she mentioned this or he mentioned this or they mentioned this. Is there any way they can answer these questions? And I have a strange feeling because there's so much we did not touch. Those questions are going to pop up. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm. We'll wait for them, and if um, they start rolling in, let's do another episode for sure. It was fun oh. talking to you. Honestly, I can't even believe an hour passed. Oh my God, it's been an hour. I know. But that was a really natural conversation and you were right. It was just like, it just, it was cool. Thank you for giving me the space to fully explain myself. And I know I rambled a little bit, but hopefully everything I said made sense. But thank you so much for that. It was honestly great. No, thank you. Because when I met you, even though we were talking about nails and shoes. (laughs) when When I met you, I think the company part was that everyone was, you were so honest with like my questions about how to approach it because I was I'm still new to it. I mean Spark9 is my first cannabis client ever. Okay, cool. I don't partake. I don't like I I respect it. I do support the legalization of it because of the history behind it. So I have that on my side. But listening to everyone listening to you and the whole thing, it just I felt like people should see what I see. Right. And, I appreciate and, that. And you're part of that. So this is this is my way of saying there's more to it than people smoking blood and listening to how I got high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, no, it's true. It's true. It definitely was a lot more substance. And again, you know, thank you for giving me the space and letting me fully talk about that and you're doing great with it honestly and don't even like it's so crazy because one day you're doing something and the next day you're in the cannabis industry and then you never quit like that's for me personally it's just been like that for a long time and i there's times where it gets really challenging and i'm like is this actually what i want to do and then i think about it i'm like yes this is what i want to do because it's so much fun and i have so much creative freedom and it's not that serious it's weed you know (laughs) so that's so true that's the one thing i do love i have more creative freedom in this industry than i do in real estate 100 percent yeah like i have never I, I brought out my sketch pads. Like I have markers in front of me. I don't really get to do any of this stuff wow. when you're discussing how to sell a building. <laughs> These are things that are not discussed. But here I'm like, okay, so we're interested in this. How about this design? Or how about this post? What do you think of this? I actually have a content calendar. Never had one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool. So yeah, I have a feeling we're going to be doing quite a few of these, and I'm really glad because I feel a little bit more normal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm really glad too, honestly, and let's do it. Let's do a couple more, and um, we could talk a little bit more about um, you know, unexpected barriers and things like that, and I'm sure you've been following the New York legalization process yes. pretty closely so we'll talk more about that for sure but yeah. you know yeah. also hit that i really thought about i think it's uh-huh. really cool to do like a creator episode and just get a couple of people on here and just treat it like like a live mm, that would be really dope too on spotify that would be really cool 
that would be really dope yeah i would i would definitely be a part of that for sure okay I love how we like exchanging ideas. Just <laughs> yeah, why not? That's the whole thing. That's the whole power of this industry is that it's exchanging ideas. It goes so far, you know, and we can't all do everything. So it is good to exchange ideas because when you work together, you get more done and you build off of people's um, existing momentum and platforms and you just get better results quicker, you know. So, yeah, I, I believe in that and I believe in you on this podcast and i hope i can hear this episode soon myself on spotify that'd be dope but for now i want to say thank you to everybody who listened my name is iman you can find me at bluntcreativeinc.com or at blunt iman e-m-a-n on instagram thank you again rita appreciate you thank you i'll talk to everyone later bye bye